get this one. This book. You know, time to stop. Get off the Amazon. Today is going to be another lovely day. There's been a lot happening. A lot happening. And um, we want to be sure that you stay in the know. But for right now, let's turn our attention to putting something in our own heads. As you see on your screen, we're, we're starting with organizational team warfare. It is important because we started with we started with different strategies, and it started with how to think and how to prepare yourself mentally for the fight. Now, we're talking about group dynamics, okay? This is where it starts, organizational team warfare. You may have brilliant ideas. You may be able to invent unbeatable strategies, but if the group that you lead, that you depend on to execute your plans is unresponsive, uncreative, and if its members always put their personal agendas first, your ideas will mean nothing. <clears throat> I'm hoping y'all are watching. I'm hoping y'all are watching. I tell you, I, my, it, this, this book has been an eye-opener for me. I don't know if you ever noticed that in your life. You know, you look up in the sky and you, you say, you know what? It's going to rain. It looked like it. I got a feeling it's going to rain. And you grab your little umbrella. You don't grab the big one. You grab the small one. So, you know, in case it doesn't rain, at least you don't have this big cumbersome umbrella that you're walking around with. But you got the small one, it's good enough. You get out and you start doing whatever you're doing and you're on your way back home or wherever. And all of a sudden, the clouds roll in. That water starts coming down. People are got the shirts over their heads, got boxes and the purses over their head. And you knew all the time it was gonna rain. Dude, that in that thing in you said, Oh, it's gonna rain. Let me let me be aware, be ready. See the other the, the other part of the reading, you know, gave us some insight as to uh, what kind of leader you should be, what kind of thought processes you should have. So now it's talking about the group. And see, we as we as dark Americans, we kind of have a challenge in that area. See, because you know, it, there's a tendency to trivialize when someone's telling you the truth. In fact, we trivialize when somebody's telling us anything. Hey, but it's right. It's one of the reasons the church can't be effective in our community. Nothing is real important until the crap hits the fan. Nothing is real important until that, that problem comes rolling down your street. You know, forget about getting an inspection on your car. Forget about, you know, getting the oil changed. Then when the car breaks down, the seas up, engine seizes up because you never changed the oil. 
So here's he's 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 trying to. I believe the creator's trying to pull us together, but we keep resisting it, and we resist it by not listening to what he says. And I mean, it's it, it's this is not a religious conversation. This is about knowing what's right to do and doing what's right. And when you know, there's times when we don't we don't think about anybody but ourselves. So let me go on through this read. It says, you must learn the lesson of war. It is the structure of the army, the chain of command, and the relationship of the parts to the whole that give your strategies force. The primary goal of war is to build speed and mobility into the very structure of your army. That means having a single authority on top, avoiding hesitancy and confusion of divided leadership. Hold on for a minute, people. You know, every once in a while we, you know, we Figure we want to get some other folks involved in the conversation. See, I happen to love my folks on Instagram. Let me see if I can get these folks in here. All right, we're keeping it moving. We're keeping it moving. All right, which one is better? All right. Okay. Got to check in with my Instagram folks. My Instagram peeps. Hello, folks. Hello, folks. Hello, folks. Hello and welcome. Welcome. I'm back here again with the uh, 33 strategies of war. We're talking about organizational warfare, right? We started to get into it, so I want to bring you up to speed. First paragraph says, as you can as you can see, let me give you the bird's eye view so that you can see. But there you go. It says, you may have brilliant ideas. You may come, you may be able to invent unbeatable strategies, but if you, if the group you that you lead and that you depend on to execute your plans is unresponsive, uncreative, and if its members always put their personal agendas first, your ideas mean nothing. So now we're that's now we're we're right to here where we need to be. It says you must learn the lesson of war. It is the structure of the army, the chain of command, and the relationship of the parts of to the whole that will give your strategies force. Now this is very very general. We know that the that he's t- focusing on warfare, but we have to understand that organizational principles apply wherever there's organization. So if you're in a if if you're in a church, if you're in the mosque, if you're in um you know have a business, if you're on a sports team, okay, the all of these things are critical. All of these things are critical. And and we we have to understand that that in in light of all that's happening, in light of all that's happening, the one thing that we're missing, see, because we got all the brains in the world, we got all the brains in the world, but we know what we don't have. We don't have people who are willing to take one for the team. 
We don't have people who are willing to say, you know what? I'm going to be B1. I'm going to um, do all I can to make our group look good. It's sad. But let me keep on reading. That means having a single authority on top, avoiding the hesitancy and confusion of divided leadership. It means giving soldiers a sense of the overall goal to be accomplished and the latitude to take action to meet that goal. Instead of reacting like automatons, they are able to respond to events in the field. Finally, it means motivating soldiers, creating an overall esprit de corps that gives them irresistible momentum. With forces organized in this manner, a general can adapt to circumstances faster than the enemy can, gaining a decided advantage. Now, I know that, you know, many of y'all never have been in the military. And I know that many of y'all have never uh, even been in the fight game. Okay? And, you know, there's the only strategy that you're trying to develop is how to get the mortgage paid and how to get the car note paid and all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and all that's good. You're taking care of your life. But remember something, when you jump in that car and you get on the highway, you're not the only one on the highway. Y'all are not listening to me. You're not the only one at the gas pump. When you go buy groceries, you ain't, you're not the only one in the store. Are you listening? So you're going to have to devise a way for you to hold yourself in that environment and, and to do what you need to do in order to be successful in whatever your goal is. From the, from, the, from the bottom up, we could take this paradigm and put it over the family. There's a single leader. Y'all are not hearing me. There's a single leader in the family. Okay? Everybody else is support. I, I, I really need y'all to hear this today because if we can get our families together, we can wage this thing. We can get this thing together. God is single. The creator is single. There are no co-sync. There are no co-creators. He's one. And that's the way he wants it. So that way it can come down. It, it doesn't, it doesn't get diluted. Okay? It doesn't get diluted. Just in fact, the word dilute means two solutions. You don't want two solutions. You want one. Okay, And granted, when you're talking about that kind of dynamic, you want to be aware that if, if I have a cup of Kool-Aid, since we like that, if we had some red Kool-Aid and I took some orange Kool-Aid and mixed it, but I didn't pour all of it in there. I now have two solutions. In one glass, it's two solutions trying to come together. So depending on how much of what you have, going to depend on the flavor that's going to dominate. So when it comes to a relationship, when it comes to a team, when it comes to an organization, if you have more than one head making a decision, you're going to polarize the troops. Oh, I like that one better. Oh, I like that one better. If there's only one, everybody got to go by the same rule and conduct. One of the challenges we have in relationships, and when I got to say this, sorry for spinning off like this, but I got to say it. One of the challenges that we're having in relationship is that there appears to be more than one standard. Are you listening to me? On a basic level, everybody's human. You eat the same way. As, as we've heard so many times before, when, the, when guys were feeling inferior, they say he puts on his pants just like you. So there's one standard that should always be adhered to, but there's in our world, there are so many different standards. There's a standard for, for those who uh, uh, honor their, 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 um, their intimacy orientation. There are some who honor their strength. There are some who honor their skin color. There are some who honor their culture. You've got so many different standards. But if you live in one country, if you live in one nation, then that standard ought to be the same. And how you express that, that's up to you. 
But it all boils down to one standard. Listen, ladies, I know y'all not going to like this, but y'all need y'all bunt spank. Because y'all are living under a, a double standard. You get to do whatever you feel like doing and nobody else can. You're the one out there doing a bunch of stuff. Okay? God, the creator, told you to submit to the man. Now, he didn't mean for the, That wasn't up for debate. I don't know where you thought that was. Men are supposed to be the heads of the household. Guys, if you're not, a, if you're not head of your household, guess what? You're borderline rebellion. Are you listening? To me? There's got to be one head. One singular head. God don't, God don't want to have no conference every time he comes down to reveal something. Prophets. Look at the, look at the Bible. Look at Quran. Look at Vedas. Look at, look at all of the, a guy who got the revelation. It was, it was him by himself. He didn't need no partner. So that way the message didn't get diluted. So right now, we're having trouble in our communities because we have so many different standards. There's two genders. There's no fluidity. It's all in your mind. You can get mad if you want to. You can call me whatever you feel like calling me. But it's not going to change the fact that if they want to find out who you are and they do a DNA test on you, on the guy that changed that that added or took away some body parts. Took away some body parts. It's gonna come up a male. You can do anything you want to, but you ain't changing that DNA. You're gonna find a you, some clown's gonna try to find a way to do that. It's like some of these women that are they're calling themselves what they call themselves now, studs. Now they're getting beards and everything. Okay. You might be calling yourself Sean. S E A N. They do a DNA test, U S H A W N. Get with that or forget it. But it is what it is. Now, you can do what you want to do, the choice is yours. This is it's not up to me to say one way or the other. But I will say this, for the sake of a community, there's only one standard, and there should always be just one standard, however you want to fit into it. Now, you hear what it says, the primary goal of war, in war, is to build speed and mobility into the very structure of your army. In other words, we want to be strong, efficient, and fast. Okay? You want to be able to pick it up and move it at any time. Okay? But I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that the Bible said that the Bible told us. He said, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. If we want to use that as a reference, let's use it. Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. No man knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. So what are you going to be doing when he shows up? Some folk are going to be asleep. <laughs> Some folk are going to be asleep. See, but the one thing about God's spirit is that God, he, he allows his children to get a bird's eye view of what's happening before it happens. And he does it by singing a prophet. All right, let's keep it moving. The military model is extremely adaptable to any group. Did you hear that? The military model is extremely adaptable to any group. Let me highlight. I like that. I like to do it right on the, I like the right live. See? There we go. The military strategy is adaptable to any group. It has one simple requirement. Before formulating a strategy or taking action, understand the structure of your group. Listen, I, I, don't, I don't know, um, you know, maybe this person, I could read more about this author because it's sounding a lot like the Bible. Sounds a lot like the Bible. The Bible tells us to know them that labor among us. It also says, try every spirit to see whether it be of God. So, how do you... This, see, this, this to me, this is joy. This, this brings me a lot of joy. Okay? 
Because because I could sit here and tell you this all day. I can sit here and tell you this all day, and I'm gonna tell you in the minds of some people who that who that Negro think he is. Yeah, I said it. Because I know I know there's folks thinking it. Oh, he's just gonna be long winded. He's just gonna be long. But you know what? You in trouble. And while you sitting up here debating as to whether you should listen or not, trouble's still encroaching. In fact, it's it's having a good time laughing at you because you you is like the last chance gas station. Y'all know that story, you know the, the you know I have an, I had an experience a while back on the Taconic Parkway. The Taconic Parkway is a is a parkway in New York in eastern New York that runs from from almost Long Island. It starts at, you know, you can get on it at Yonkers, White Plains. You get on the Taconic and you start traveling north. There's a long road that leads up to it before you get to it. And there's gas stations along the way. Then there's this one gas station right at the place where you enter, and it says this is the last filling station for 40 miles. Those who ever traveled to kind of know what I'm talking about. And you know what? We could see all the stupid people because we drive right by them. And you know what? They, they have a rule on the highway when you have a, a gas-related issue, you open your tank and you put a, a a rag in there. That'll tell the person passing your car, this is what's wrong with the car. Okay? You just run out of gas. It doesn't need a tow, but it needs gas. So then, you know, if you're sitting there or you happen to make a call, you're going to be a while getting there. You're going to be a while with somebody getting there. It's the same thing. You know, we we got to stop playing with this thing because we're we're not gonna. It's not gonna. We're not gonna be here forever. I just read some stuff just today. Okay, I don't mind showing you. Okay, this is a report. Are you hearing me? Look at. I ain't got to read it for you. You know how to read. Y'all see it? See, I'm just going to give you a little, give you a few minutes, let that marinate for a minute. See, because there, there's a time when you got to, you got to start looking at facts and you got to start looking at truth. about that let's see what the problems were see that see I, I, I'm just I just want to give you a moment to read this and do yourself a favor and, and kill a Kill a stereotype right now. That one that says if you want to hide something from a dark American, put it in a book or on a page. See? This is what I'm saying. Y'all busy following the crowd. Y'all see that? Hope y'all listening, and I hope y'all watching. See that you see them folks on Instagram. I hope y'all see it. But you know that some folks ain't playing. See, I give you a brief, give you a brief as to what this is about. There was a lady who had been working for this company for twenty years. This company is a contractor for Pfizer, and they are jacked up. They just straight jacked up. She dealt with it, and then she got tired. And then she, and as soon as she raised her concerns, they, they first of all, they they blew her off. 
Then she sent a letter, an email to the FDA. And as soon as she, they found that out, they fired her. And so they, they finally, they printed the concerns. The British Journal of Medicine picked it up and published it. Okay? And that's where that's from. The British Journal. Ain't no American journals doing nothing. Okay? Ain't no American papers telling you that these companies is jacked up, their contractors are jacked up. They didn't tell you that there's problems with the trials. They didn't tell you there's problems with the vaccine. They ain't going to tell you none of that. So you want to find out the truth, you better get out this country and find it because it, it ain't going to happen here. But that's part of the strategy. Okay? So, that shot you got in your arm, <clears throat> probably need to learn a little bit more about it. But anyway, let's keep it going. It says the military model is extremely adaptable to any group. It has one simple requirement before you formulating a strategy or taking action, understand the structure of your group. In other words, get to know the folks in it, get to know their skill sets, get to know their temperaments, get to know those little nuances that make it possible for you to place people in a strategic position to do the best work. I'm sure that you can do a good work, but you want to put people in that are doing the best work. I'm former military, and I know that I was I was a marksman on the pistol, but I was an expert on the rifle. So I would have been a good sniper. But there was a guy next to me, man. That guy could put a bullet in the black, and it didn't matter where it come from. Okay? He had all kinds of top awards and medals, okay? So in the fray, where do you want one of us? You probably want him close. He could be a lot more effective because he's more accurate close. Me, I'm a long-range kind of guy. You want to set me on the mountaintop, click, click, and drop it right in their front pocket, okay? Watch this. It says you can always change it and redesign it to fit your purposes. The following three chapters will help you focus on this critical issue and give you strategic options, possible organizational models to follow, as well as disastrous mistakes to avoid. Now, that's good information right there. Let's go on to the next one. All right, here we go. The first one, avoid the snares of groupthink. I know what you're getting ready to say. Uh, and I'm gonna probably I'm gonna put this on my other program called the frontal lobe because I believe that when you educate a person, you heal the land. So let's get some education going on now. It says avoid the snares of groupthink. If anybody understands and knows what groupthink is, groupthink is the process by which one person establishes something. One and, and and another person validates their claim, and everybody just follows along for the sake of following along, without any real knowledge. I, I was I was watching the Kings of Comedy, and uh, uh, Cedric the Entertainer said, "Black people don't get in trouble because they run." Okay, they run. Somebody they see somebody get up running, they take off running, don't know why they running. That is group thing. Let's go on ahead. The command and control strategy. The problem in leading any group is that people inevitably have their own agendas. If you are too authoritarian, they will resent you and rebel in silent ways. If you are too easygoing, they will revert to their natural selfishness and you will lose control. You have to create a chain of command in which people do not feel constrained by your influence yet follow your lead. Put the right people in place, people who will enact the spirit of your ideas without being automatons. Make your commands clear and inspiring. All right, here we go. We're going to highlight thing. All right. Make your commands clear and inspiring, focusing attention on the team, not the leader. Create a sense of participation, but do not fall into groupthink. The irrationality, this is, they gave you a, de, um, a definition. The irrationality of collective decision making, that's group thing. Make yourself look like a paragon of fairness, but never relinquish unity of command. Okay, 
This guy here, Carl von Clausewitz, they use him a lot. He uses him a lot in this book. Okay? He is the, he is their version of Sun Tzu. He is their version of Shaka Zulu. He is their version of of um of Hannibal. Okay? How very different is the cohesion between that of an army rallying around one flag carried into battle at the personal command of one general and that of an allied military force extending 50 or 100 leagues or even on different sides of the theater? In the first case, cohesion is at its strongest and unity at its closest. In the second case, unity is very remote, often consisting of no more than a shared political intention and therefore only scantly and imperfect while the cohesion of the parts is mostly weak and often no more than illusion. Carl von Clausewitz, 1780-1831. All right? Now, as is the tradition of this book, he tells a story. And right from history. All right? Let's see how long it is. I'll show you, just like I'm looking at. Okay, there we is again. Got Napoleon Bonaparte. Apparently, Napoleon was a, was a, was a beast. Okay, let's talk about it. The Broken Chain. World War I began in August 1914. By the end of that year, all along the Western Front, the British and the French were caught in a deadly stalemate with the Germans. Meanwhile, meanwhile, though, on the Eastern Front, Germany was badly beating the Russians, allies of Britain and France. Britain's military leaders had to try a new strategy, and their plan, backed by the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, and others, was to stack on, was to stage an attack on Gallipoli, a peninsula on Turkey's Dardanelles Straits. Turkey was an ally of German, of Germany's, and the Dardanelles was a gateway to Constantinople, the Turkish capital, which is present-day Istanbul. If the Allies could take Gallipoli, Constantinople would follow, and Turkey would leave, have to leave the war. In addition, using bases in Turkey and the Balkans. The Allies would attack Germany from the southwest, southeast, excuse me, dividing its armies and weakening its ability to fight on the Western Front. They would also have a clear supply line to Russia. Victory at Gallipoli would change the course of the war. The plan was approved, and in March 1915, Sir General Sir Ian Hamilton was named to lead the campaign. Hamilton was at 62, was the able strategist and experienced commander. He and Churchill felt certain that their forces, including Australians and New Zealanders, would outmatch the Turks. Churchill orders were simple. Take Constantinople. He left the details to the general. Hamilton's plan was to lead at three at land at three points on the southwestern tip of the Gallipoli Peninsula, secure the beaches and sweep north. The landings took place on April 27th. From the beginning, almost everything went wrong. The army's, the army's maps were inaccurate. The troops landed in all the wrong places. The beach were much narrower than expected. Worst of all, the Turks fought back unexpectedly fiercely and well. At the end of the first day, most of the Allies, 70,000 men had landed, but were unable to advance beyond the beaches where the Turks would hold them pinned down for several weeks. It was another stalemate. Lipley had become a disaster. All seemed lost, but in June, Churchill convinced the government to send more troops, and Hamilton devised a new plan. He would land 20,000 men at Sulva Bay, some 20 miles to the north. Sulva was a vulnerable target. It had a large harbor. The terrain was low-lying and easy. And it was defended by only a handful of Turks. An invasion there would force the Turks to divide their forces freeing up the Allied armies to the south. Stalemate would be broken and Gallipoli would fall. To command the Sova operation, Hamilton had to force, had, was forced to accept the most senior Englishmen available for the job, Lieutenant General Sir Frederick Stopford. Under him, General, Major General Frederick Hammersley would lead the 11th Division. Neither of these men was Hamilton's first choice. Stopford, a 61-year-old military teacher, had never led troops in war and saw artillery bombardment as the only way to win a battle. He was also in poor health. Hammersley, for his part, had suffered a nervous breakdown the previous year. It is not 
in war, it's not men, but the man that counts. Napoleon Bonaparte, 1769-1821. Hamilton's style was to tell his officers the purpose of the upcoming battle and then leave them leave, leave it to them how to bring it about. He was a gentleman, never blunt or forceful. At one of their meetings, for example, Stopford requested changes in the landing plan to reduce risk. Hamilton politely deferred him, deferred to him. Hamilton did have one request. Since the, once the Turks knew of the landings at Sova, they would rush in reinforcements. As soon as the Allies were ashore then, Hamilton wanted them to advance immediately to the range of hills four miles inland called Tekitep and to get there before the Turks. From Tekitep, the Allies would dominate the peninsula. The order was simple enough, but Hamilton, so as, to, as not to offend his subordinate, expressed it in the most general terms. Most crucially, he specified no time frame. He was, he was sufficiently vague that Step Stupford completely misinterpreted him. Instead of trying to reach Tekitep as soon as possible, Stopford thought he should advance to the hills if possible. That the order was that was the order gave he gave Hammersley. And as Hammersley, nervous about the whole campaign, passed it down to his colonels, the order became less urgent and vaguer still. Also, despite his deference to Stopford, Hamilton overruled the lieutenant general in one respect. He denied a request for more military bombardments to loosen up the Turks. Stopford's troops would outnumber the Turks at Sova 10 to 1. Hamilton replied, more artillery was superfluous. The attack began in the early morning of August 7th. Once again, much turned bad. Stopford's changes in the land and lands made a mess. As his officers came ashore, they began to argue, uncertain about their positions and objectives. They sent messages to ask for the next step. Advance, consolidate. Advance, consolidate. Hammersley had no answers. Stopford had stayed on the boat offshore and from which to control the battlefield. But on that boat, he was, he was impossible to reach quickly enough to get prompt orders from him. Hamilton was on and on and away. The day was frittered away in argument and endless relaying of messages. The next morning, Hamilton began to sense that something had gone wrong. From reconnaissance aircraft, he knew that the flat land around Sova was essentially empty and undefended. The way to take Tekitep was open. The troops had only to march, but they were staying where they were. Hamilton decided to visit the front himself. Reaching Stopford's boat late that afternoon, he found a general in self-congratulatory mood. All 20,000 men had gotten ashore. No, he had not ordered the troops to advance to the hills. Without artillery, he was afraid the Turks might counterattack, and he needed the day to consolidate his position and land his supplies. Hamilton strained to control himself. He had heard an hour earlier that Turkish reinforcements had seen hurrying towards Silva. The Allies, the Allies would have to secure Tekitep this evening, he said, but Stopford was against a night march, too dangerous. Hamilton retained his cool and politely excused himself. Now, When we're talking about planning and we're talking about, you know, waging this war, understand this right here, that it just in that part alone, the confusion and and nobody knowing what, let me tell you something, what that will lead to, listen here, it will lead to the breakdown of any fragile relationships you have in your ranks. And and and, and if you don't believe it, if you don't believe it. Consider the time when when you were on a team and there was one person that wasn't doing so well. The person who was maybe the star player, maybe he was the one that they fed the ball to, the captain of the team, whatever. He was the go-to guy and you couldn't go to him. Pretty soon, all of a sudden, there were steals, there were people getting the ball swatted away, people were missing shots. And if there was a weakness on it, you could look on the court and find out the two people that were having a problem. You could find it out. Okay. So listen here. 
while you're while you're looking at what things are going on, understand there are several things going on at once. Several. Okay? And it's bigger than the shop. Okay? It's bigger than the shop. First of all, they exploit your internal problems because you can't shut up. You're always talking. You're arguing in public. You're doing all kinds of stuff on video. You let them know what's going on, and they just exploit it. So guess what? If you live in the ghetto, you know how they fix it? By giving you a house. They want to pacify you, give you some place to live, give you some money, give you some food. Okay? Then you got another group that's that's coming in that they're supporting that is dividing dividing you about because there's a bond that's weak. Are you following that? They exploit the weak bond, the bond between the man and the woman. They exploit that. So now your family's fragmented. And you know what? They keep on mentioning and keep on drilling on your head that this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. You notice they're always talking about single-parent household, single-parent household, single-parent household. Uh, no daddy in the house, no daddy in the house. Uh, you know, poverty. You know, uh, the, you know, they, they're talking about all of that stuff that's wrong with you. So then now that you start thinking, okay, well, maybe there is something wrong with me. And they say, yeah, you're absolutely right. So guess what? This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. We're going to give you some counseling sessions. We're going to help you get a free education. We're going to, you know, give you some, give you some money to tide you over because we know that this situation ain't working. Then. Once you start getting comfortable, all of a sudden, it comes a disease. See, you you haven't even you haven't even gotten yourself together from the other things yet. You're just you're just getting on the road to recovery, and then all of a sudden, here comes here comes a shot, here comes the virus, okay? And all the confusion around that, and they keep the confusion going. They don't let you talk about it. They don't let you say nothing about it. Every time you say something to somebody, they'll censor it. Every time you say something, whether it's true or false, it doesn't matter. They're censoring it. and just... So now you start feeling like you start getting ready to throw your hands up. Are you listening? But that ain't all. That ain't all. Now, after that, see, remember, you, 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 got, you got the propaganda machine going. You got the, the, the divisive tools starting to, to dig in. Now you got these challenges and troubles that's, that's going on. Then they're really barreling down, getting nailing down on you as an individual. Start taking away your rights. You don't need them anyway. You ain't got good sense. Had literally had the leader say that people are ignorant. What kind of leadership is that? You want to bring people together, but you're going to tell them they're ignorant. Tell them they don't know stuff. Insult them, okay? Tell them things like, if 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 you're not on board with this, you're inferior. St stupid stuff, okay? So you got a lot of stuff going on. Why are they doing that? To destabilize the country. They can come in with something new. It's it, it, and I don't know why people don't see that. See, I'm a martial artist by trade, okay? And before I be, be, remember something, before I was a minister, I was a warrior. Okay? Before I was a minister, I was a warrior. Okay? And it was, to me, to me, I, I, I found it, it was perfect. It was perfect because God is all powerful who would, who would never allow us to, to, to destroy ourselves. He would send people that would uh, help us to get our things together. And everywhere I went, I found the exact same thing. Confusion and ignorant folk trying to act like they know stuff. And we got people following them, following them faithfully. I, we hear stories all over the place how how they're, you know these older people have been giving their money to a particular organization. They almost their whole adult life, and they couldn't even give them a decent funeral when they died. Was talking about taking tithe of their uh, of their uh, 
there's their life insurance policies. I mean, it's just it's it's just nuts. Okay. But I want you to understand by by doing this and reading this, I, I need you to understand that now you won't have a choice. You won't have no excuses. Somebody's telling you exactly what's going on. See, that's see, we we can't use plausible deniability anymore. We can't. And if you try, you're in for a rude awakening. Okay. It's not enough for us to, it's not enough for us to find out that we're really not citizens of this country. We're de facto. Look it up, I ain't got time. All right. So we need to have develop a strategy and we need to develop it right now. And so with every waking moment, we ought to be thinking about what we're going to do to rescue our families, what we're going to do to rescue our grandchildren, what we're going to do to rescue our elderly. What are we going to do as a community? What are we going to do for food? What are we going to do for water? What are we going to do for shelter? What are we going to do? Y'all not thinking about that? Hmm. I'll tell you what, what would happen if you went and knocked on one of their doors. It just a to assume bang you with some rock salt. Get yourself away from here. Okay? So, <clears throat> this has been a meeting with the bishop. It's a serious day. Hoping y'all get it. But if you don't get it, I just pray there's a place for you off this earth. 